We all wish we could be more creative. We also wish that that somewhere within us is a creativity that goes unharnessed, that goes untapped. And if we could just tap into it, if we could just access it, it's going to help us live a more exciting life. It's going to help us stand out in business and in our careers. And it's going to help us create the most extraordinary things. Those things are all true. You do have an untapped creativity. It is there. You are not leveraging it. But why, you have to ask yourself. Because if you're like most people, you tell yourself that it's too late in life. It's too selfish for you to put creativity first. That's not a serious thing, being creative. I'm, I'm too busy. I don't have enough time to just play around. I'm a busy, serious person. So you don't do it. Or maybe you tell yourself that if you just had enough money, you'd be free to spend your time doing what you love. Or maybe you just tell yourself it's status or it's ego that's driving you to be creative. And, and that false modesty that you have pulls you down because you don't want ego to drive you. You don't want status to drive you. You want it to be real. Or maybe, just maybe, you think your family and friends would think you're completely crazy for chasing down your creative dream. Whatever it is, whatever's keeping you from embracing your creativity, from turning your ideas into real things, your passions into a career, whatever it is, we tend to brush aside our ideas. Our dreams live on standby. Our lives feel average. Interesting, maybe, but average. And so I believe that everyone, every single one of us has a creator spirit. We were born to create, to dream up ideas, to bring them into the world, to share them with others. And so no matter what you do, no matter who you are, you are creative. You can call it innovation, call it outside the box thinking, you can call it problem solving. Those are all just synonyms for creativity. And so in today's episode, we are going to dig into creativity. And I want you to know this. If you take away one thing from this talk, creativity isn't reserved for starving artists. Creativity is within you. Welcome to We Do Hard Things, the show about facing fears, taking big risks, and chasing down dreams. On today's show, I talk creativity with the godmother of creative structures, writer, author, and the creator of The Artist's Way, Julia Cameron. In this conversation, we get into the nuts and bolts of how you can become more creative, how you can get unblocked, and how you can build confidence in your ideas. The first question I have is, you know, in your new book, Seeking Wisdom, you really do draw a ton of parallels between spirituality and creativity. Why is it that you think creativity and spirituality are, are so closely tied together? Well, I think that creativity and spirituality are tied closely together uh, because that's the way the world works, uh, <laughs> that we have a creative energy that moves through us. Uh, and that as it moves through us, uh, it inspires us. I believe in a line from Dylan Thomas, the force that through the green fuse drives the flower. Uh, and that creative energy uh, is what I think of in terms of a higher power. Uh, and it, it flows to us and through us. Uh, and we are each one individual, uh, and we have a, a, a destined identity. Uh, and I think uh, what you're talking about when you talk about creativity and spirituality being one and the same, uh, it's a matter of putting forth a genuine prayer to whatever you choose to believe in. And so do, do you believe that you can, I, I don't want to put too fine of a point on it, but there are plenty of people who are creative who are not spiritual or they're spiritual without even realizing they're creative. So what is the, the kind of the overlap in the Venn diagram for, for these two things? Well, I think uh, that what happens uh, is that as we move into our creativity, we have an expanded sense of self. 
uh, and uh, that uh, I've had people say to me, Julia, I'm an atheist. <laughs> Can I still be creative? Uh, and the answer is, yes, you can, and yes, you do. Uh, and I think when you work on your spirituality, your creativity automatically expands. And when you work on your spirituality, you find yourself um, becoming larger and wiser. I think it's a mistake to say, oh, you have to be a believer in order to be a creator. But I think uh, throughout the centuries, artists have said, you know, Brahm said, straight away the ideas come to me directly from God. <laughs> and nowadays uh, we find ourselves um, mincing words a little bit. Well, I don't think anyone would say that you have to be a believer to be creative. Um, I think most people today would say that you can be creative without ever needing to be a believer. And you draw such tight parallels between, again, we'll use the word spirituality, but whether that's God or whether that's um, you know, people praying, praying to Mick Jagger. You know, the 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 point is that that you draw a really tight connection between these two. I think most would think that they can be creative without ever being spiritual. I don't know how to respond to this question uh, because I find uh, when people come to talk to me, uh, they usually are saying, "I had a funny feeling." Uh, and I, I think we should talk a little bit about some of the basic tools uh, because I believe that they are what move people uh, into seeing an expanded universe. So what would that be? Well, for example, uh, I ask people to do morning pages. Okay. I'm going to break into the conversation real quick to give you a little bit of backstory. If you don't know Julia Cameron or her groundbreaking book, The Artist's Way, for almost 30 years now, this book has been the go-to book. Structure? Let's go with structure. For almost 30 years now, this structure has changed the way millions of creatives have approached their work. 30 years in print, 5 million copies sold. There's something to this. Now, in the foreword to The Artist's Way, Julia shares how people come up to her all the time and tell her that this book changed their life. And then she tends to respond with this line, no, you changed your life. You used the tools, I laid them out for you. So those tools are so important to why for so many years, so many millions of people have turned to this. And I'm gonna quickly walk you through the four groundbreaking tools that have changed the way millions of people tap into their creativity. Number one, morning pages. We're gonna talk about this a lot in this episode. Morning pages are three pages of long handwriting that you do each and every morning, part journal, part nonsense, three pages. That you write out each and every morning about anything, anything at all, often a mishmash of thoughts and sometimes pointless. Morning pages give you the chance to talk out things, to talk things out like you would with a friend. But instead of a friend, it's just you, a notepad, and a pen. The real magic is that they allow you to get out of your head all the worries and fears and distractions standing between you and an extraordinary day. Okay, the second tool is artist dates. Julia talks a little bit about this in our interview. The artist date is a one to two hour, once a week solo adventure that you take just for fun. It's basically scheduled play. Julia believes that your inner artist, my inner artist, is a youngster and that we need to make room in our schedule for adventurous play and delight. And if we have this play and this delight, we're going to open ourselves up to new creative ideas and inspiration. Tool number three is going for a walk. <laughs> the third tool costs nothing. It's old school. You're just going to go for a walk. No dogs, no music, no podcasts, no friends, no one else. You're not meeting anyone. You're not out there doing anything. It's just you and your thoughts outside in the world for 20 minutes, twice a week. And tool number four, we really dig into this one during the interview, writing out guidance. 
This is Julia's newest tool, but the idea is that as you work through your morning pages, you're gonna ask questions. Need help? Ask for help. Need guidance? Ask for guidance. Not sure what to do? Ask, what should I do? It's basically part prayer, part meditation, but like through writing. And so you write out whatever you need guidance for, and then you listen. You listen for a reply, kind of within you, kind of what, what pops into your head, what comes into your mind. And then you write out whatever comes into your head. Julia writes in her latest book, Seeking Wisdom, she breaks down in depth how this helps her. But she also writes this, I love this, this is a quote. But Julia, I'm asked sometimes, what if it's just your imagination that your prayers are answered? And I reply, if it's just my imagination, it's still good. And my imagination is far wiser than I have thought. I love that quote. Okay, now that you have a handle on the tools, let's pick up the conversation where we left off. People usually start off saying, Julia, my life is so dull. And I'll say, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, try morning pages. And they get into it a few weeks and they go, oh, my life is interesting. <laughs> I'm interesting. And as we find ourselves uh, getting more honest on the page, we find ourselves getting more honest with our fellows. Uh, and we find ourselves saying, oh, I asked about this, and lo, I, I seem to have an answer. It's interesting to me that, that, that people come to you. I, I guess, you know, you've been doing this for, for well over 40 years, and you've developed a really strong fan base where, where the people that you're speaking to are, are open to um, spirituality or Christianity. Um, people, uh, you know, embrace the morning pages. Um, I'm not sure if people come along and ever challenge you on it, or if at this point... Um, it's it's just so part of of uh, an artist's um, toolkit to be able to do the morning pages or to be able to have the date or or any of the kind of other tools that you've developed along the way. So, are you asking me if I'm people ever challenge me? <laughs> sure, yeah. I think people come to me thinking I'm going to be a sort of a scold, and in, instead I say no. I'm trying to urge you to have some fun. <laughs> and people say, fun? I don't see what fun has to do with working on our creativity. So when I teach, uh, if I say, I have a tool for you to use, it's a nightmare. You have to get up 45 minutes early. You have to get your hand to the page. People will say, oh, I can do that because we have a strong work ethic uh, and people understand working on their creativity. But then if I say, now, once a week, I want you to go out by yourself and do something festive, people get very uptight. The body language shifts. They fold their arms across their chest. They cock their heads to one side, uh, and they're, they're skeptical, and they say, I, I don't see what play can have to do with working on our creativity, uh, but it has everything to do with it. Why is that? Because I can see that work feels like progress. It feels like uh, you're growing, you're, you're, you're putting in the hours, it, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, it's a hustle. I do struggle with play myself. Um, I do not, you know, I work is play to me or, you know, being in the backyard, moving dirt around with a giant piece of machinery is play to me. But, you know, sitting down to, uh, to play a game or to, to go spend an afternoon at the park or something, it's just, it, 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 you're right. Like for, for me or my generation, it just feels like the time could be better spent hustling or working or making progress? Well, I was noticing um, that you're not wearing your T-shirt that says, we do hard things. Uh, and I was thinking, well, what hard things do I assign? Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, we do hard things is we do morning pages. <laughs> 
and and of course now you've I mean we have the benefit of learning all of these tools uh, through your teaching through your experience but if we go back the the pivotal point in your life where your husband um, has decided to leave you where you're forced to admit to yourself that you're an alcoholic and what I found most interesting in that story was the fear of not being able to perform or write without alcohol the fear that whatever whatever worked for you before if you drop that even though it's not serving you the fear is that maybe you're not a good writer maybe you won't be capable of writing so can you talk a bit about this fear this fear of not being able to perform and then the flip side of that the trust that you have to have within yourself or or god or the universe that you always can uh, i had a very primal fear uh, which said I wouldn't be able to create uh, without a bottle of scotch. I thought writing uh, and drinking went together. Uh, many we had many a, famous writers have said so in the past, right? <laughs> yes, we have a mythology uh, that tells us that writers are drunks. Uh, and uh, we have a mythology that tells us that well, I I want to say that we need additives uh, in order to access our creativity. What I found uh, was that this was not the case. Uh, and I posted that little sign by my writing station that said, Okay, God, you take care of the quality. I'll take care of the quantity. I began to try to be of service. Before that, you know, I was... Um, I wrote for Rolling Stone. I wrote for Miami Vice. I I was hip. <laughs> uh, and when I got sober, uh, I had to face the fact uh, that maybe there was a better way to do things. Uh, and I had people telling me to just try. Uh, and I think... Uh, that that's a lesson uh, that I try to pass on to people now with morning pages and artist dates. Just try. And what do people report back when they do? Oh, my God, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> and then you say, don't act so surprised. <laughs> In your book, you mentioned you're, you're really writing more for ego. Um, and yet on the other side of, of that, when you became sober, when you discovered morning pages, when you started to uh, pray through writing, you started to come from more of a place of service. What, what was really the difference between, between the two? Is it, is it really about the writing? Is it more about mindset? Were you just more humble? Is it that the writing has changed or even that these tools have changed or did you just fundamentally change at your core? That's a good question. What I found myself saying was if it's a choice between creativity and sobriety, I'm not so sure I'm going to choose sobriety. But I was promptly told, Julia, without sobriety, there will be no creativity. I found myself experimenting. You know, I, I had such an investment in being hip. <laughs> that it, it really took some open-mindedness uh, to try to do anything else. I think I struggled uh, with being less caustic, and I had previously tried to write everything so that people would say, she's brilliant, she's brilliant. And now suddenly I was trying to say, try this. It's useful. Can we talk a little bit about courage? I think, you know, it takes a lot of courage to be truly yourself. And when you're an artist, whether it's a musician or a writer um, or whatever, it might be a performer, you start by mimicking what you appreciate about others. But then there's a point where you have to be truly yourself. You have to be original. And that takes a lot of courage. In your experience, how can we 
tap into that courage and how can we build up that courage so that way we can be uniquely ourselves kind of quicker without without copying everyone else so much? Well, what I want to say uh, is, is that morning pages are the grease slide to courage uh, because they're for your eyes only. You dare to say what you really feel. Uh, and you become authentic. Uh, and it's as if you're sort of s- sending a telegram to the universe, this is what I like, this is what I don't like, <laughs> this is what I want more of, this is what I want less of. Uh, and um, as you do this, it's as if you're, you're drawing a map of your own interior, uh, and yes, you become more authentic, you become more original. Uh, and what we think of with uh, originality is that we need to remember that it has the root word origin. We are the origin of our own work. So I think uh, what happens with Morning Pages is that they they urge people to dare it takes courage to dare. Uh, And the courage, first of all, is daring just on the page. For me, what happened was I had been writing morning pages about 15 years, and I was doing that fourth tool that you talked about of writing out guidance. Uh, And I, I wrote out the guidance that said, what should I do next? And I heard, you will be writing radiant songs. <laughs> and I thought, you're crazy. <laughs> I'm 45 years old. If I were the least bit musical, I would know it. Another week went by and I wrote, what should I do next? And I again heard, you will be writing radiant songs. <laughs> so... so I thought, I can't do that. So then a third week went by, and it was like a dare. You will be writing radiant songs. Uh, And I was staying with a girlfriend in the Rocky Mountains, and I went went to her and said, Terrell, I keep praying for what to do next, and I keep being told I'm going to write songs, and I'm not musical. And she said, well, why don't you go sit down by the creek? and see what happens. So I went down to the mountain, to a Rocky Mountain Creek, uh, and I sat on a boulder, and I was sort of half-assed meditating. <laughs> what What and, is half-assed um, meditating? What does that look like? That looks like I'm not really focusing on what's around me. I'm daydreaming. I'm listening to the water and getting... uh, So what happened was I suddenly heard, My green heart is filled with apples. Your dark face is filled with stars. And I went running up the mountain, (laughs) and I found my girlfriend, and I said, I think it's a song. Uh, and what happened was it opened an inner door. I noticed uh, half of your team is British, uh, and I came to write more guidance. So what should I do? I'm writing these songs. And they said, wouldn't it be fun to write a mu- musical about Merlin? And I thought, well, if I were the least bit musical. But what happened is I began to write songs. I think I'm not answering your your question. But this is so much more interesting than my question. So let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so let me let me let me ask if creativity flows through you from 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 God and you receive it and it flows through you and as you're writing, you're being surprised by what you're even writing because you're seeing it for the first time. And if this is a gift that's given to you, how do you know you can count on it? when you need it most? Like, how do you know that that this will be there when you sit down and it's really required of you? 
okay, you do morning pages. <laughs> and when you do morning pages, you sort of drop down the well and write whatever occurs to you. And that trains your sensor to stand to one side. I have a, a critic, an inner critic, uh, named Nigel. Ah, Nigel's the worst. He's British, isn't he? <laughs> yes, he's a, a, an interior decorator. Uh, and Nigel doesn't think anything that I do is ever good enough. Uh, and Nigel will say, you're boring. And what I've learned to say is, Nigel, thank you for sharing. And move right on past him. Uh, and this becomes a learned skill. By writing morning pages and miniaturizing your sensor, you learn that you can drop down the well and contact a flow of creativity at any time. I think we're talking here about faith and having faith that the flow of ideas will be there. What I have found is that when I drop down the well, I have a first thought. I think what we are trained to do is to mistrust our first thoughts. But actually, our first thoughts are very powerful. They lead to the second thought, the third thought, the fourth thought. Uh, and there's your flow of ideas. I have a girlfriend who says, Dear God, open my heart before I open my mouth. <laughs> Putting pen to page, we say, Okay, I am going to access an inner flow. Okay, God, you take care of the quality. I'll take care of the quantity. How do you then keep from judging yourself because the morning pages are not meant to be you know print ready they're they're meant to to be stream of consciousness and to get your thoughts out and to help you explore new ideas so, with the idea of all of this quantity now three pages every single day and all of this writing how do you how do you not judge the first thought or the third thought or the fifth thought like how do you know what's good and what's bad as you're as you're just putting this all out there we have a process we write morning pages we learn to tell our critic to stand to one side. Uh, and the, the critic uh, starts out being a, a looming figure, uh, a very threatening figure, uh, a figure that says, you're just no good. What happens when you work with pages and you move past your critic is that it becomes a portable skill that you take with into your other forms of writing. So then when your critic says you're boring, you say to your critic, oh, Nigel, negative again. Uh, and your critic uh, becomes sort of like a little cartoon character who is always nasty. Uh, and you get to understand that your critic has negativity as habituality. Uh, and I think, um, I think this is where uh, that fourth tool is so useful. All right. So, so the, tell us, tell the, us a bit about it. So this is the guidance, right? Yeah. The tools go morning pages every single day, miniaturizing my sensor. Artist dates once a week, going out doing something festive uh, and enjoyable that sort of makes you in touch with the benevolence of the world. Walking, going out for a 20-minute walk a couple times a week just by yourself. Uh, and then the fourth tool is, what should I do about X? Uh, and you're training yourself to to listen to what uh, I, I describe as your higher self. The voice that you hear back is comforting. So you're, you're saying, um, well, I wrote a play this oh, during the pandemic, uh, and I found myself saying, 
aren't they lovely? And I thought, what's that mean? Aren't they lovely? And the guidance came back, use bird song. Open your play with bird song. So that was an answer to X, what should I do next? And the answer was, open your play with bird song. So what I find with the, um, with the guidance is that you can say to it, I didn't like what I wrote yesterday. And then you listen. And a lot of times you'll hear, you just don't know the ending, you're impatient. And then what do you do? And then you keep writing. Ah, <laughs> then you keep writing. This, this guidance of, of asking the questions and writing out the response, you align this with, with prayer, essentially, um, that, it's, that it's a different way to be able to, to you know, connect with, um, with God, if, if that's what you believe in, um, with, with a, a deeper level of spirituality or being able to tap into even stuff that's within you. Is it that the more you do it, the more you trust the process? Because, because you write in your book that the guidance was never wrong. Um, and it could be that the guidance was never wrong or, or you manifested it, right? Like you, you, you had the idea, you worked towards it, and then it proved itself right. Am I overthinking this or, or is there something are. deeper I here? I think you're, you know, I noticed um, reading a, dis- a description of the show yes. uh, that we do hard things and we need ways to move past what you call the haters, I think that morning pages give you a way to move past the haters, uh, and guidance gives you a more benevolent view of them. I, you asked if I ever challenged. Yesterday I got uh, a letter that was just really nasty. Uh, they said, uh, you only talk to people who are famous. <laughs> and <laughs> I thought... They don't know my friendships. I found myself going for guidance and asking, what about the letters writer? And I got told, Julia, your need is compassion. She is alone and afraid. She has burned all her bridges behind her. Uh, And she's friendless. And getting told to have compassion and to pray for her kept me from getting a hateful, resentful feeling to attack back. That, <laughs> that you know, I in my interviewing style, I typically like to challenge people, mostly not because I disagree with them, but mostly because I'm working to elicit a bit of a, a bit of a response. But you know what I found so almost challenging to prep for this interview with you is you answer all of the challenges already within your writing, you know, if it, it in, in deeper in the book, Thank you. you know, <laughs> well, you make my job very hard though. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> only, so only, because, only because it's so thorough that it's, it's almost like, what, what could I ask? Because it's all here. You know, it's it, the morning pages from, again, as I mentioned, the many, many, many people who have done it and the many years it's been in print, they work. I'm almost a bit challenged to challenge you because the proof is in the pudding, right? Like, you know, if you, if you, if you do the work, you will be able to get inspired. You will be able to get unblocked. If you lay out these questions and take time and and do all of these steps, you will get responses. And so I'm almost just going a few layers deeper just to ask whether it kind of just works and it's kind of a miracle or whether there's like truth to this, if, if you know what I mean. Well, I hope there's truth to this. I mean, right now... you dedicated now, your life to it, right? <laughs> uh, yes, right now, uh, The Artist's Way is on the bestseller list in Los Angeles, uh, and it's been 30 years since the book was published, uh, and there it is, number three. People are not gullible. You know, five million people have bought the book and tried Morning Pages, and I think uh, we have to say, uh, if not Julia knows what she's talking about, uh, 
they know what they're talking about. I know amongst amongst uh, creatives and amongst artists, it's like, I don't, I'm going to use this term out of loosely. It's like the Bible for uh, being able to follow the process to get unblocked. How did putting that to paper, so it's one thing for you to discover it, for you to use it, but putting it to paper, how did that change your life? Uh, very gradually. I thought I was writing the book for myself and 10 friends. <laughs> then the the book caught fire. It's interesting to me. I have a friend who likes the prayer book. And he said to me, Julia, I'm a Jew and an atheist. Hardly your target audience. <laughs> but the book spoke to me. I say at the beginning of The Artist's Way, don't let semantics get in your way. If you don't like the word God, use good orderly direction. Use universe. Use spirit. Use Obi-Wan Kenobi. I think the learning curve for me has been how open-minded the higher power is. I have had people say to me, Julia, you wrote a Sufi book. Or, Julia, you wrote a Buddhist book. I find myself thinking the book takes on the coloration of the reader. So, in your case, I would say it's a druidic book. <laughs> <laughs> Am I druidic? That, that's, I've, I've never been called that yet. So, I'm calling you druidic. I'm going to I'm going to go deeper into that because I I I quite I'm I I'm learning quite a bit about stoicism and I I quite like some of their principles but um I'm going to I'm going to look into the druidic uh background. So uh, we haven't talked about what I call believing mirrors. And uh, believing mirrors are people who reflect back to you your strength, your possibility, your size. Uh, and um, one of the things uh, that I felt in reading the description of the show uh, was the importance of finding for yourself people who weren't jealous. Yeah, finding those believers, those people who s see you for what you are, but also for what you could be without judgment. You know, those are, those are people you need to keep in your life. Right. Those are believing mirrors. And so if someone's listening and they feel like they don't have those people, how do you find them? How do you, how do you seek them out? I'm going to sound like a fanatic. You ask for it, right? You sit down and you ask for guidance? I ask for guidance. Uh, I ask uh, for courage. I ask to be clear-headed and clear-eyed. The letter that I got last night was painful. Uh, and I realized, you know, when she said you only talk to people who are famous, she was saying, I'm not famous enough for your attention. She was coming from a position of being less than. Uh, and that she, I realized she couldn't be for me a believing mirror. As we start to wrap this up, for you, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? I have a friend who's not famous, <laughs> whom, I talk, <laughs> whom I talk to every night, uh, and um, she says, what were your positives? And so I make a little list. I wrote my morning pages. I took an artist's date. I walked on the treadmill for 36 minutes. Uh, I um, ate well. I worked on my project, and I was kind. And that was the, um, the evening wrap-up, was saying, uh, or if I was blue during the day, I was blue, but despite being blue, I managed to write morning pages, walk on the treadmill, eat well, like that. So it's counting up the positives of the day uh, and being grateful uh, and 
I think gratitude is something that takes a little bit of practice to say, well, I'm grateful for the day that's gone by. Do you struggle with the constant feeling that you're not good enough? Are you looking to unlock your full potential? If so, you have got to check out the conversation I had with the author of the ridiculously amazing book, Worthy Human. Click on the link right over there to hear this real inspiring story.